Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Today's episode is called, Zodiac Killer. San Francisco Zodiac Killer is one of the most infamous, and most elusive, serial killers of all time. I like killing people because it's so much fun. In July of 1969, a letter arrived at the San Francisco Examiner newspaper, containing those chilling words and a coded message. The sender, the soon-to-be notorious Zodiac, a serial killer who terrorized Northern California in the late 1960s and early 1970s with a combination of grisly murders and bizarre public letters brimming with horrific threats, demented demands, and mysterious ciphers teasing his identity. That identity has stymied law enforcement officials, professional codebreakers, and armchair criminologists alike for nearly five decades. While officially connected to five murders and two attempted murders, the Zodiac hinted he had killed at least 37 victims. After taunting the police and the public with nearly two dozen communiques, he seemed to vanish in the late 1970s. But his twisted legacy endures. June 4, 1963 Robert Domingos and his fiancée Linda Edwards were seniors at Lompoc High School in Santa Barbara County in Southern California. On Tuesday in early June 1963, the couple decided to use the senior ditch day to go sunbathing on a beach near Gaviota State Park. When the two teenagers didn't return home by Wednesday, Robert's father went to the beach and was horrified to discover their bodies lying together inside the remains of a crumbling shack. The victims, bound with rope, had apparently tried to escape but were shot and killed with a 22 caliber weapon. Robert was shot 11 times, and Linda had been shot 9 times. The killer then dragged the bodies to the shack, where he tried and failed to start a fire. Investigators had few leads but, in 1972, the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department announced a possible Zodiac connection. The beach killer used Winchester Western Super X ammunition, the same ammunition used by the Zodiac during the 1968 murders on Lake Herman Road. This case also had similarities to the Zodiac's attack of another young couple at Lake Berryessa in 1969. October 30, 1966 Eighteen-year-old Sherry Josephine Bates lived with her father Joseph and was a student at Riverside City College in Riverside, California. On October 30, 1966, she left a note that read, Dad, went to the RCC library. The next morning, her Volkswagen Beetle was found abandoned in the library parking lot and her body was lying nearby between two houses. She had been stabbed several times, and her throat was slashed. Police found a men's Timex watch at the crime scene, a print from a military boot, and some hairs and dried blood on the victim's hand. Sherry Joe's purse was intact, and an autopsy revealed no evidence of sexual assault. One month after the murder, the local newspaper and the police department received typewritten letters titled The Confession from Someone Who Claimed to Be the Killer. The author wrote, Miss Bates was stupid. She went to the slaughter like a lamb and added, I am not sick. I am insane. In April 1967, the newspaper, the police, and Joseph Bates received virtually identical handwritten letters which read, Bates had to die. There will be more. The notes were signed with a symbol that resembled the letter Z. In 1969, 
Riverside Police contacted investigators in Northern California regarding the similarities between the Zodiac crimes and the murder of Sherry Jo Bates. Sherwood Morrill, who was the documents examiner for the California Department of Justice, concluded that the Zodiac was responsible for the notes linked to the Bates case. The Riverside connection was later revealed to the public by Paul Avery, reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle. Zodiac then sent a letter to the Los Angeles Times indicating that the killer confirmed the theory that he had killed Bates. The Zodiac wrote, I do have to give them credit for stumbling across my Riverside activity, but they are only finding the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more down there. Years later, Riverside police rejected the Zodiac theory and focused on a man who they said was a rejected, former lover, of Bates. In the late 1990s, police obtained a sample of the suspect's DNA to compare with the DNA taken from the hairs found in the victim's hand in 1966. The DNA didn't match and the suspect denied any involvement in the murder. December 20, 1968 Five nights before Christmas, high school students Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday set out on their first official date together, promising Betty Lou's parents they'd be home by 11 p.m. Shortly after that time, passing motorists saw the Rambler and its occupants parked at a lover's lane spot along Lake Herman Road in Benicia, California. Moments later, another driver noticed two seemingly lifeless bodies on the side of the road. Benicia police and others responded to the scene and discovered Betty Lou dead, with five bullet wounds in her back. David was found next to the Rambler with a bullet shot into his head, still breathing, but near death. Bullet holes in the car's roof and back window indicated that the killer may have fired warning shots to force the victims out of the vehicle. Shell casings recovered at the crime scene identified the ammunition as Winchester Western Super X Copper Coated. Ballistic evidence indicated that the killer used a 22 caliber, possibly a J.C. Higgins Model 80 semi-automatic pistol. Investigators believed the two teenagers were likely random targets, killed by a stranger for unknown reasons. July 4, 1969 More than seven months after the murders of Faraday and Jensen, on the night of July 4, 1969, a gunman attacked a second young couple at the nearby Blue Rock Springs Park, northwest of the crime scene at Lake Herman Road. Darlene Farron died from multiple gunshot wounds, but her friend Michael Majo survived wounds to his leg, neck, and jaw. Majo told police that Darlene had picked him up at his home and the two had intended to drive to Mr. Ed's diner, but decided to go to the park instead. Darlene parked her Corvair in the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Park and the two were talking when a vehicle pulled into the parking lot. The occupants laughed and set off fireworks in celebration of Independence Day before driving away. Soon after, another car pulled into the parking lot and stopped behind Darlene's Corvair. The driver waited for a moment and then drove off. Minutes later, the car returned and parked. The driver stepped out and held a bright light as he approached the puzzled occupants of the Corvair. Mike and Darlene thought that the man was a police officer. The stranger walked to the passenger side and pointed a gun at the occupants of the car. The gunman fired several shots, hitting both Mike and Darlene. He then turned and began walking back to his vehicle. Mike cried out in pain and the gunman returned to fire several more shots at the already wounded victims. 
The stranger then climbed back into his car and drove away. He later used a payphone just blocks away from the Vallejo Police Department and called the station. When police dispatcher Nancy Slover answered, the caller spoke in a low, monotone voice, as if he were reading from a prepared script. I want to report a murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway, you will find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. Darlene died on arrival at the hospital, but Michael survived. According to Nancy Slover, the voice of the man who called the Vallejo Police Department indicated that he was at least 30 years of age or older. Surviving victim Michael Majo was able to describe the gunman when interviewed by Vallejo Police Detective Ed Rust. According to Majo, the suspect was a white male adult, short, possible 5'8", was real heavy set, beefy build, not blubbery fat, but real beefy, possibly 195 to 200 pounds or maybe even larger, short curly hair, light brown, almost blonde, with a large face. Majo later viewed photographs of various individuals but he was unable to identify any possible suspects. September 27, 1969 On a Saturday in late September, college students, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were relaxing along the shore of Lake Berryessa, some 30 miles north of Napa, California. A man appeared holding a gun and wearing a hooded costume with a white crossed circle stitched over the chest. Explaining that he had escaped from a prison and needed money and a car to escape to Mexico, the stranger bound their wrists with pre-cut lengths of plastic clothesline. Without warning, he plunged a large knife into Brian's back six times. He then stabbed Cecilia ten times as she fought for her life. The man then walked to Brian's car and used a pen to draw a crossed circle on the door with the dates and locations of the previous attacks. The date, September 27, 69, the time 6.30, and the notation, by knife. At 7.40 p.m., the Napa Police Department received a call placed from a telephone booth located a few blocks away. Officer David Slate listened as the caller said in a low, monotone voice, I want to report a murder, no, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park Headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carmen Ghia. Slate asked the man to provide his location, but the voice only grew more distant as the caller replied, I'm the one who did it. Investigators from Napa met with detectives in Vallejo and Benicia and compared notes, but were unable to develop any solid leads. The Zodiac may have believed that the three law enforcement agencies were not up to the task, and he invited the San Francisco Police Department to join in the hunt. October 11, 1969 Paul Stein, a 28-year-old student and husband, worked as a cab driver in San Francisco. That night, Stein picked up a fare headed for a destination in the upscale Presidio Heights neighborhood. At the intersection of Washington and Cherry Streets, the passenger shot Stein in the head and removed a piece of the victim's shirt. The man walked away just before the police arrived, but the police radio broadcast mistakenly described the suspect as a black man, and passing officers dismissed a white man resembling the correct description. Fingerprints found inside the cab and on its exterior were photographed and collected. On the driver's side of the vehicle, police found fingerprints which appeared to contain traces of blood. 
Investigators believed that these fingerprints may have been left by the killer. Three young witnesses watched the crime in progress from a house directly across the street and contacted police. According to the witnesses, the killer was last seen standing in the exact area where the fingerprints were discovered and he was apparently touching the cab and using a piece of the victim's blood-stained shirt to wipe at its surface. The case was considered a routine robbery until the office of the San Francisco Chronicle received an envelope with a letter from the Zodiac which began with the words, I am the murderer of the taxi driver. The envelope also contained a blood-stained piece of Paul Stein's shirt. The Zodiac denied he left fingerprints and claimed that the police sketch was inaccurate because he had worn a disguise. March 22, 1970 On a Sunday in late March, 22-year-old Kathleen Johns packed her infant daughter into a station wagon and left San Bernardino, California to visit her sick mother in Petaluma, in the northern part of the state. Kathleen was also seven months pregnant with the child of her longtime boyfriend. As she traveled on Highway 132 near Modesto, another vehicle pulled alongside the station wagon and the driver appeared to signal that Kathleen should pull over. On the side of the road, the driver explained that the back wheel of Kathleen's station wagon was loose, but he promised to fix the problem. Instead, he loosened the lug nuts and the wheel fell off as Kathleen tried to drive away. The man then offered to drive Kathleen to a gas station, but she climbed into his car and discovered he appeared to have other plans. She claimed he also made veiled threats to harm her child. Eventually, Kathleen grabbed her daughter and jumped from the car. A passing driver took Kathleen to a nearby police station where she identified the stranger from a police sketch of the Zodiac. Months later, a Zodiac letter mentioned a rather interesting ride with a woman and her baby. September 6, 1970 A postcard attributed to the Zodiac featured an advertisement for a condominium project in Lake Tahoe. Nevada, with the phrases Pass Lake Tahoe Areas and Sought Victim 12. Some interpreted the cryptic message as a clue to the disappearance of 25-year-old Donna Lass. In May 1970, Donna worked in San Francisco at Letterman General Hospital, located on the Presidio military base near the area where the Zodiac killed a cab driver. Donna moved northeast to South Lake Tahoe and found work as a nurse for the Sahara Hotel and Casino. On September 6, 1970, Donna vanished sometime after the last entry in her work logbook at 1.50 a.m. Her car was later found abandoned near her apartment. According to some accounts, an unidentified man called Donna's employer and her landlord claiming she had to leave town due to a family emergency. Donna's family told authorities there was no such emergency, and the man was never identified. Investigators suspected Donna had been abducted and killed, but her body was never found. Her disappearance remained a mystery, and her name was added to a long list of possible Zodiac victims. August 1, 1973 The search for new leads in the Zodiac case led investigators across the United States to Albany, New York. The office of the Albany Times Union newspaper received an envelope postmarked August 1, 1973, with a crossed circle drawn in the corner instead of a return address. The letter read, You are wrong. I am not dead, or in the hospital, I am alive and well, and I am going to start killing again. Below is the name and location of my next victim, 
But you had better hurry because I'm going to kill her August 10th at 5 p.m. when the shift changes. Albany is a nice town. Below the message, the writer included three rows of symbols. According to an FBI report, Bureau Crypt analysts deciphered the coded message to read Albany Medical Center. This is only the beginning. Investigators were unable to identify any murders that could explain the vague reference to a victim on August 10th. Handwriting experts could not determine if the new letter was prepared by the writer of the Zodiac letters, due to the lack of significant characteristics in the Albany message, but this possibility could not be eliminated based on the limited analysis. Twenty-six days after the shooting on July 4, 1969, at Blue Rock Springs Park, three envelopes arrived at the offices of three Bay Area newspapers. Each envelope contained a handwritten letter and a piece of a coded message. The writer provided a list of details regarding the two shootings and explained that the coded message, which would reveal his identity, the letter ended with a warning, if you do not print this cipher by the afternoon of Friday, 1st of August, 1969, I will go on a killing rampage Friday night. I will cruise around all weekend killing people in the night, then move on to kill again, until I end up with a dozen people over the weekend. A crossed circle symbol had been drawn at the bottom of the page. Each of the newspapers complied with the demand to publish the cipher, and news of the gunman's threats created fears that he would strike again. Experts and amateurs scrambled to decode the cipher while investigators sorted through hundreds of tips from helpful citizens, including a couple who believed they had solved the puzzle. The deciphered message did not reveal the killer's identity but the words did offer a chilling portrait of the author's state of mind. I like killing people, because it is so much fun. I will not give you my name, because you will try to slow me down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. When authorities expressed doubts concerning the writer's claims, another letter arrived and began with the words which would forever send chills throughout Northern California. Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. In answer to your asking about the good times I have had in Vallejo, I shall be very happy to supply even more material. The writer provided more details about the attacks and then took issue with some factual errors in news reports about his crimes. San Francisco investigators believed that cab driver Paul Stein was the victim of a routine robbery until the Zodiac began to send scraps of Stein's blood-soaked shirt to prove they were mistaken. An envelope postmarked October 13, 1969, contained one scrap of Stein's shirt and a chilling letter. The letter ended with another terrifying threat of violence. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning just shooting out the front tire plus pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing out. Patrol cars and aircraft followed buses to and from schools and armed officers rode on board for added protection. A description provided by the three young witnesses produced a composite sketch of the man seen exiting Stein's cab. This sketch was later amended, reportedly to accommodate corrections by witnesses. The following description was distributed to the public white male adult, in his early 40s, 5'8", heavy build, reddish-blonde crew-cut hair, wearing eyeglasses, dark brown trousers, dark, navy blue or black, parka jacket, dark shoes. The amended description read, white male adult, 35 to 45 years old, 5'8", reddish-brown hair, crew-cut, heavy rim glasses, navy blue or black jacket.
San Francisco PD officers Eric Selms and Donald Falk were responding to the police call when they reportedly passed a white male adult who matched the description and was walking away from the area of the crime scene. Falk later provided the following description of the suspect in his official report. The suspect that was observed by Officer Falk was a white male adult. 35 to 45 years old about 5 foot, 10 inches, 180 to 200 pounds. Medium heavy build, barrel chested, medium complexion, light colored hair, possibly graying in rear. Crew cut wearing glasses, dressed in dark blue waist length zipper type jacket, navy or royal blue, elastic cuffs and waistband zipped part way up. Brown wool pants pleated type baggy in rear, rust brown, may have been wearing low-cut shoes. Subject at no time appeared to be in a hurry walking with a shuffling lope, slightly bent forward. The subject's general appearance, Welsh ancestry. Officer Falk stated that he and Officer Zelms did not stop to question the man they observed that night due to a mistake in the police broadcast which described the suspect as a black male adult. The ongoing mystery attracted the customary crackpots, wild tips, false confessions, and hoax letters. Infamous defense attorney Melvin Belly entered the story during a televised phone conversation with a man claiming to be the Zodiac. Police traced subsequent calls to Belly's home and identified the crazed imposter as a patient in a mental hospital. During one call to Belly's home, the Zodiac imposter declared, Today's my birthday. The so-called belly birthday call has since become the subject of controversy. As if to reclaim the publicity, the killer mailed a letter to belly and included another blood-soaked scrap of the cab driver's shirt to prove that he was the real Zodiac. Despite belly's public offer to help the killer, the real Zodiac never contacted the famous attorney again. Another communication from the killer was postmarked on November 8, 1969. The Zodiac sent a greeting card which read, Sorry I haven't written, but I just washed my pen, and I can't do a thing with it, an apparent play on the catchphrase from a popular shampoo commercial of the time. The envelope also contained another coded message, consisting of 340 symbols. This time, experts and amateur codebreakers were unable to decipher the so-called 340 cipher and the Zodiac's message remained unknown. The Zodiac followed with another letter, postmarked November 9, 1969. In six pages of rambling text, the killer declared that he was angry with police for telling lies about him and that he would change the way the collecting of slaves by staging his crimes to appear to be routine robberies, killings of anger and a few fake accidents. The Zodiac also refuted police claims that he had left fingerprint evidence behind at the scene of the Stein murder, and he announced that he was wearing a disguise during his crimes. The letter included a formula to build a fertilizer bomb and a hand-drawn diagram of the proposed device. The San Francisco Chronicle published an article on December 28, 1969, which stated, in part, a few days after the Stein killing, Zodiac sent a letter to San Francisco newspapers and included a swatch from Stein's shirt. Another letter and another piece of Stein's shirt was sent to a newspaper on November 11th. According to a document produced by the San Francisco PD and sent to the FBI in 1978, the Zodiac's letter of November 9, 1969, was accompanied by a portion of Paul Stein's bloodstained shirt. In the late 1990s, the San Francisco PD produced another document which read, in part, November 9, 
1969, San Francisco Chronicle handwritten note, this is the Zodiac speaking bomb diagram. The last line referred to Alan Keel, the former chief of the San Francisco PD Crime Lab, who resigned in 1991 amid controversy and criticism. According to the ABC television show Primetime, a Zodiac DNA sample was obtained from the back of a stamp affixed to the envelope, which had contained the Zodiac's notorious dripping pen card, mailed on November 8, 1969. The program also stated that this communication was accompanied by a piece of Stein's shirt. Despite the apparent confusion regarding which Zodiac communication was accompanied by a piece of Stein's shirt, the available information indicates that the Zodiac included a piece of the bloodstained shirt with one of these two communications, the November 8th card or the November 9th letter. The first shirt piece was sent with the October 13, 1969, letter which claimed credit for Stein's murder and the other piece was sent to attorney Melvin Belly with the letter of December 20, 1969. If the Zodiac included a portion of Stein's shirt with the communications of November 1969, three pieces of Stein's shirt accompanied three Zodiac communications. The November 9th letter also contained what would become the Zodiac's most sensational and controversial claim, that he had been stopped and questioned by two San Francisco police officers who then allowed him to escape. Also, two cops pulled a goof about three minutes after I left the cab. I was walking down the hill to the park when this cop car pulled up and one of them called me over and asked if I saw anyone acting suspicious or strange in the last five to ten minutes, and I said yes, there was this man who was running by waving a gun and the cops peeled rubber and went around the corner as I directed them, and I disappeared into the park, a block and a half away, never to be seen again. The Zodiac conspicuously marked this section on the margin of the page and wrote, must print in paper. The San Francisco Police Department refuted the Zodiac's claim. The only two police officers who had reportedly seen the suspect were Eric Zelms and his one-time partner that fateful night, Donald Falk. Zelms was killed in the line of duty on January 1, 1970. Falk adamantly denied the Zodiac's version of events, but the story became one of the many persistent myths which dominated public accounts in the years to come. The Zodiac also demanded that the people of the Bay Area wear some nice Zodiac buttons bearing his chosen symbol, the crossed circle. When the public did not comply with his wishes, he wrote that he had punished them by shooting a man sitting in a parked car. Press reports linked the Zodiac to many other unsolved crimes, including the March 1970 abduction of a young woman. Kathleen Johns told authorities that she had accepted a ride from a mysterious stranger who resembled the Zodiac but the man had turned menacing and threatened her life. Johns claimed that she managed to escape by jumping from the man's car. The Zodiac later claimed that he was responsible for the failed abduction in a subsequent letter. In one letter, the killer included long rambling descriptions of his fantasies of torture along with selected passages from the Gilbert and Sullivan musical, the Mikado. Some letters also featured a box score, which credited the Zodiac with an increasing number of victims followed by the notation, San Francisco PD equals zero, and the taunt, I hope you have fun trying to figure out who I killed. Given the killer's apparent freedom to do, as he pleased, one passage was difficult to refute. The police shall never catch me, because I have been too clever for them. 
The failure to catch the Zodiac was a constant source of embarrassment for his chosen nemesis, the San Francisco Police Department. Each new letter became a liability as the psychotic pen pal wrote, Hey Blue Pig, doesn't it rile you to have your nose rubbed in your boo-boos? And, I have grown rather angry with the police for their telling lies about me. Reporter Paul Avery received a Halloween card from his new, secret pal, the Zodiac. Avery later learned of a possible link between the Bay Area killer and the unsolved murder of a young girl in Southern California several years earlier. The California Department of Justice and the Napa County Sheriff's Department had considered the possible Zodiac connection at the request of Riverside authorities who believed that the Zodiac may have been responsible for the crime. College student Sherry Jo Bates was murdered near the campus of Riverside City College on the night of October 30, 1966. Someone who claimed to be the killer had sent letters and notes to the police, a local newspaper, and the father of the victim. Question document examiner Sherwood Morrill of the Department of Justice and FBI experts concluded that the Zodiac may have written these messages. In a letter mailed to the Los Angeles Times on March 13, 1971, the Zodiac wrote that he was impressed by the police work which had linked him to the other case, but he claimed that there were still more victims yet to be found. Tired of playing with his apparently inferior pursuers, he challenged them and wrote, If the blue meanies are ever going to catch me, they had best get off their fat asses and do something. Correspondence from the killer ceased and the trail of the killer grew cold by the summer of 1971. As the Zodiac disappeared, someone like him began to appear on movie screens everywhere with the release of the Clint Eastwood action classic, Dirty Harry. Shot in San Francisco, the film featured Inspector Harry Callahan, a character reportedly based on San Francisco PD Inspector Dave Toshi, one of the investigators assigned to the Zodiac case. Callahan tracked a Zodiac-like villain named Scorpio who hijacked a school bus and met a violent demise in a final shootout with Eastwood. The Hollywood version delivered for audiences the justice which reality had refused to provide. The Zodiac resurfaced with a series of letters in the spring of 1974. The letter postmarked January 29th. 1974 offered a review of the satanic blockbuster, The Exorcist. The writer described the film as the best satirical comedy he had ever seen. This letter also contained another quote from the musical, The Mikado. He plunged himself into the billowy wave and an echo arose from the suicide's grave. The Zodiac demanded that the letter be printed in the newspaper and warned, or I'll do something nasty, which you know I'm capable of doing. The writer did not use the name Zodiac, as if to underscore the suicide theme and suggest that he had abandoned the persona in favor of some new and perhaps improved alter ego as a social critic. The San Francisco Chronicle then received a suspicious card postmarked February 14, 1974. The text read, Dear Editor Did You Know That The Initials SLA, Symbionese Liberation Army, spelt SLA, an Old Norse word meaning kill. The card was signed, A Friend. In a letter postmarked May 8, 1974, the writer expressed his consternation regarding what he considered the murder glorification in deplorable advertisements for the film, Badlands, which depicted the bloody crime spree of young lovers Richard Starkweather and Carol and Fugate. 
Another letter postmarked July 8, 1974, demanded the termination of a San Francisco Chronicle columnist because he suffered from a serious psychological disorder. Once again, the killer vanished. Headlines such as Cops No Closer to Zodiac's Identity and occasional articles reporting tenuous links to other unsolved cases kept the story alive over the years. The Zodiac crimes grew into local legend, and the ghost of the killer became a modern boogeyman in the serial killer pop culture phenomenon of the late 1970s. A new breed of monster, the multiple murderers, had given birth to a lucrative market for graphic and often lurid crime books. The gruesome careers of John Wayne Gacy, the son of Sam, Ted Bundy, and others provided a limitless supply of material for the so-called true crime genre, but many of the resulting books were often more fiction than fact. Almost a decade after the first brutal shootings along Lake Herman Road, Robert Graysmith, a cartoonist employed at the San Francisco Chronicle, was at work on his own book about the Zodiac case. After conferring with San Francisco PD Inspector Dave Toshi, the celebrity cop in charge of the investigation, Graysmith had developed his own theories as well as a suspect named Arthur Lee Allen. Tashi and his partner Bill Armstrong had investigated Allen in 1971 and 1972, but abandoned the suspect when they failed to produce any evidence to link Allen to the Zodiac crimes. Allen's fingerprints did not match the suspected Zodiac fingerprints found at the scene of the Zodiac's last known murder in San Francisco. Sherwood Morrill Question document examiner assigned to the case by the California Department of Justice had concluded that Allen did not write the Zodiac letters. Morrill's conclusions would be confirmed by other experts in later years. In April 1978, the San Francisco Chronicle received what appeared to be another letter from the Zodiac. The new letter mentioned Inspector Tashi by name and rumors spread that the publicity-conscious cop had forged the letter. The subsequent media scandal caused great embarrassment for the San Francisco Police Department. Sherwood Morrill had retired after the Zodiac's last known communications in 1974. San Francisco police contacted John Shimoda at the U.S. Postal Service Crime Lab and requested a review of Morrill's analysis of the Zodiac letters. Shimoda believed that the 1978 letter was an authentic Zodiac communication, and he also examined the writings in the Riverside case, which Morrill had previously concluded were the work of the Zodiac. An FBI memo, dated May 18, described Shimoda's conclusions. On May 11, 1978, Mr. Shimoda examined, for the first time, these Riverside, California, letters and formed the opinion that they were not authored by Zodiac. We are requesting this additional examination to settle the disputed authorship due to the seriousness of the case. The memo stated that police had also contacted Michael Bertocchi of the State Bureau Department of Justice, CINI. Bertocchi said that further examination of all the Zodiac letters was warranted. Robert Prouty, chief of the question documents section of the State Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation was asked to analyze the 1978 letter. I examined the photographs of the April letter and those of previous letters attributed to Zodiac, Prouty said. My first impression was that it was in the same general style as previous letters, but after closer examination, my ultimate conclusion was that there were so many differences that it was not written by the same person who wrote the previous Zodiac letters. 
Several letter characteristics, in my opinion, did not match the style used by Zodiac. The slant of some letters was not consistent with previous Zodiac communications. Other experts later agreed with Prouty's conclusion. Keith Woodward, former head of the Documents Department at the Los Angeles Police Department, wrote that the April letter was a carefully drawn copy of the true Zodiac printing. The general overall construction in the question documents indicates the letter was constructed by a person that had access to printed letters of Zodiac. Woodward added that the letter was a poor attempt by an unknown writer to copy the true hand printing of Zodiac. CINI Documents examiner Terence Pasco also concluded that the writing was the work of a forger. Even John Shimoda of the U.S. Postal Service Crime Lab reversed his previous opinion that the letter was authentic and declared the letter a fake. I am of the opinion that the letter of April 24 was an attempt to duplicate Zodiac letters and is not authentic. One expert believed the 1978 letter was written by the Zodiac Sherwood Morrill. The last letter was by the real Zodiac. There is no question in my mind, Morrill declared. He said the writing was definitely by the Zodiac we knew in the past. I examined it. The characters and handwriting are just dead bang the same. Throughout his career, Morrill stated that he believed that the Zodiac was using his normal handwriting when preparing the Zodiac letters. However, author Robert Graysmith later claimed that Morrill had endorsed Graysmith's theory that the Zodiac was using an overhead projector and sample of handwriting belonging to other people in order to create the infamous style of the Zodiac's writing. If Graysmith's claim was correct, then Morrill's conclusions were rendered suspect as his endorsement of the cartoonist's so-called projector theory was in direct conflict with Morrill's stated opinions regarding the method used to create the Zodiac letters and the handwriting of the killer. In an attempt to clear the apparent confusion and conflicting opinions regarding the authenticity of the 1978 letter, Police filed yet another request with the FBI, and its findings contradicted those of some previous examinations yet, confirmed others. The letters show a wide range of variation and various writing speeds. Additionally, portions of the material, particularly the Riverside letters, may have been disguised or deliberately distorted. For the above reasons, the hand-printing examination of these letters was inconclusive. However, consistent hand-printing characteristics were noted in the letters which indicate that one person may have prepared all the letters and the message found on the desktop in the Riverside case. The FBI analysis appeared to confirm the findings of retired handwriting expert Sherwood Morrill regarding the Riverside letters and desk as well as the 1978 letter. However, Morrill's conclusions regarding the Riverside writings were refuted by John Shimoda of the U.S. Postal Service Crime Lab and at least four other experts had rejected Morrill's opinion and concluded that the 1978 letter was a forgery. The results of the analysis did little to clear the cloud of confusion surrounding the authenticity of any suspected Zodiac communications. At a press conference held on the afternoon of July 11, 1978, Chief Gain announced that Inspector David Tashi had been removed from the Zodiac case and transferred to the pawn shop detail. Gain then further stunned reporters. The continuing investigation of the Zodiac case by our Zodiac investigation team established in April 1978 had led to the conclusion that there is reason to doubt whether Zodiac in fact wrote the April 24th letter. According to Gain, 
Tashi was not a suspect in the forgery case, and the police investigation had cleared Tashi of all suspicion. A memo produced by the San Francisco Police Department Crime Lab stated that the suspected Zodiac forgery of April 1978 was not an authentic Zodiac communication. If the 1978 letter was, indeed, a forgery, then the Zodiac had fallen silent in 1974 and had not communicated since that time. The Zodiac story faded from the headlines in the years that followed the scandal surrounding the 1978 letter. The 1986 release of Robert Graysmith's book immediately generated a new wave of news coverage that forever changed the public perception of the case and altered the course of the Zodiac investigation. Titled Zodiac the book read like a screenplay featuring the author-turned-amateur sleuth at the center of the ongoing drama from the beginning, sharing secrets with investigators and hot on the trail of the killer. The cartoonist claimed that he had deciphered a Zodiac code, proved that the killer had used a projector to disguise his own handwriting, and discovered an astrological pattern to the crimes. United Press International writer Richard M. Harnett's review of Zodiac appeared in the Los Angeles Times on February 9, 1986, and offered some of the only media criticism of the book. Harnett wrote that a good account of all the facts in the Zodiac affair would have been a valuable contribution, but Graysmith, a newspaper cartoonist, took on the role of amateur sleuth rather than historian. He neglects those parts of the historical record that don't fit into his scenario. The author's prime suspect, named in the book as Bob Hall Starr, was actually a convicted child molester named Arthur Lee Allen. Reported as a possible Zodiac suspect in 1971, Allen had been the subject of a brief investigation which had failed to produce any evidence linking him to the crimes. According to Graysmith, this man was a suspect in another string of killings, had confessed his guilt to friends, terrified his family, taunted police, and even described details of the crime before they occurred. Along with other convincing tales, these stories appeared to prove that Allen was, in fact, the elusive Zodiac. Unsuspecting readers of the book could not have known that most of the stories regarding the Graysmith as suspect were not true, or that his theories, code solution, and other claims were equally dubious. Despite its many factual errors and falsehoods, the book became a bestseller and the media anointed the author as the expert on the seemingly solved case. Newspaper articles, television news reports and documentaries used the book as a definitive reference source and often repeated its myths as fact while helping to convict the child molester in the court of public opinion. After the publicity surrounding the release of the book Zodiac, a man claiming to be the Zodiac Killer surfaced with a series of shootings and letters in New York City during the early 1990s. Authorities dismissed the possibility that the original Zodiac Killer had actually returned. The New York gunman responded with an angry declaration that he was the real Zodiac. This is the Zodiac. The note sent to the Post, not to any of the San Francisco. The Zodiac letter you are wrong, the handwriting looks different, it is one of the same Zodiac as the one in San Francisco who killed a man in the park with a gun and killed a woman with a knife and killed a man in the taxi cab with a gun. Like his inspiration, the New York Zodiac seemed to vanish. When he returned to claim more victims, some observers doubted that he was the real copycat killer, leading to confusing nicknames used in media reports such Zodiac 2 or Zodiac 3. For years after his reign of terror began, 
Police arrested unemployed high school dropout Eriberto Eddie Seda. A search of Seda's possessions revealed a well-worn copy of Robert Graysmith's book Zodiac. Unlike his predecessor, Seda was convicted and sentenced to serve 83.5 years in prison. Shortly after the copycat Zodiac resurrected the Zodiac story in the news, aging career criminal Ralph Spinelli contacted the Vallejo Police Department in hopes of trading information for a deal to avoid a 30-year prison sentence. In exchange for his total freedom, the helpful felon was willing to testify that Arthur Lee Allen had accurately predicted that the Zodiac would kill a cab driver in San Francisco. Spinelli had a history of antagonism with the suspect that dated back decades when a fistfight between the two men resulted in their arrests. Vallejo Police Captain Roy Conway rejected Spinelli's offer, but used his claims to launch a new investigation of Allen conducted by retired Detective George Bewart. Information later surfaced that the police department had purchased dozens of copies of Robert Graysmith's book as a factual reference. The second investigation failed to produce any evidence to implicate Allen but searches of the suspect's Vallejo home led to a media circus and a spotlight on the accused man. Allen professed his innocence during interviews with reporters and even appeared on a segment of the tabloid television program A Current Affair. In the spring of 1992, freelance writer Ryder McDowell interviewed Allen in his home while researching an article for the San Francisco Chronicle. McDowell described the ill and aging suspect as disarmingly friendly and wrote that Allen had acknowledged that he had spent time in jail and gotten away with a lot of bad things, but he denied any involvement in the Zodiac case. Allen told McDowell, it wasn't me, and that's the truth. And if people want to believe it was me, well, that's their problem. I was cleared on every angle, including the handwriting tests. Plus, I don't look anything like the guy. Reporter Rita Williams repeatedly asked Allen if he was the Zodiac and whether he was ready to confess. Allen declared in obvious frustration, I'm not the damn Zodiac. After the media revealed his status as the prime suspect in California's most notorious unsolved murder, Allen died amid a flurry of unsubstantiated rumors linking him to the crimes. News reports described Allen as the man most investigators believed was the Zodiac, an epitaph that could have been etched onto his tombstone. Lingering doubts about Allen's guilt and the credibility of Graysmith's sensational book ensured that the case remained an ongoing media mystery for years to come. Like London's Jack the Ripper mystery, the Zodiac case became an irresistible lure for many other amateur sleuths ready to peddle new theories and a list of suspects no writer of fiction could have conceived. A wealthy San Francisco businessman, a former Harvard lecturer, and a cast of unlucky men were wrongfully accused, while other theories linked the Zodiac to the Unabomber, members of the murderous Manson family, Texarkana's Phantom Killer, Wichita's BTK Strangler, and other notorious crimes throughout history. The Zodiac story found its way to the Internet, where websites featured updates on the case, police files, and crime scene photographs, as well as public message board debates regarding the various suspects and theories. Publicity surrounding one website devoted to suspect Arthur Lee Allen inspired Graysmith to write a sequel to his first work titled, Zodiac Unmasked. The second book offered little more than another highly fictionalized account of the case, as well as many unsubstantiated or factually inaccurate claims concerning the evidence said to connect Allen to the Zodiac crimes.
Shortly after the publication of the book, the San Francisco Police Department submitted the known Zodiac letters to its newly developed crime lab for forensic testing. Attempts to extract DNA from the letters proved successful, and Dr. Cinda Holt and others were able to develop a partial genetic profile. According to the ABC television documentary program Primetime, the sample in question was obtained from the back of a stamp, affixed to the envelope which had contained the Zodiac's notorious derping pen card, mailed November 8, 1969. Members of the San Francisco PD believed that the DNA profile belonged to the Zodiac and was valuable evidence useful in eliminating suspects. Critics, skeptics, and theorists with pet suspects excluded by DNA comparisons claimed that the profile was unreliable while citing aging or contaminated biological material on the letters and envelopes as cause to dismiss the findings. Arthur Lee Allen was among those suspects excluded by DNA comparison, yet this seemingly important fact, and the lack of credible evidence to link him to the Zodiac crimes, did little to deter his accusers. In April 2004, the San Francisco Police Department made a stunning announcement. The case is being placed inactive, said San Francisco Police Lieutenant John Hennessy, head of the department's homicide unit. Given the pressure of our existing caseload and the number of cases that remain open at this time, we need to be most efficient at using our resources. By 2007, Robert Graysmith's book served as the basis for the major motion picture Zodiac directed by David Fincher, the man behind the serial killer cult film, Seven. This telling of the Zodiac story followed the cartoonist, portrayed by Brokeback Mountain star Jake Gyllenhaal, as the unlikely hero who pursues suspect Arthur Lee Allen and unlocks the mystery of the Zodiac crimes. Fincher told a reporter working for the New York Times, it was a difficult thing to make a movie that posthumously convicts somebody. Gyllenhaal told reporters that he portrayed Robert Graysmith, the man who solved the case. Retired Napa County Sheriff's investigator Ken Narlow, assigned to investigate the Zodiac attack at Lake Berryessa in 1969, served as a consultant on the film. In an interview with reporter Marcia Dorgan of the Napa Register, Narlow said the film did not focus on the crimes. It is based on Chronicle cartoonist Robert Graysmith's book, Zodiac. He explained, The movie is about the obsession that Chronicle guys and the two San Francisco inspectors had in trying to solve the case. It took over their lives. The Zodiac would kill and then send these letters in code to the Chronicle and law enforcement challenging them to find him. The movie is about the pursuit of the suspect, not focusing on the Zodiac killings. Retired Napa County Sheriff's Deputy Dave Collins also served as a consultant for the film and was on the scene of the 1969 stabbing at the lake. Collins was not impressed by the ongoing attempts to posthumously convict Arthur Lee Allen in the court of public opinion, and remarked, we don't believe that Allen is the Zodiac. There is not enough evidence to prove that. The Sheriff's Department considers the case to still be open. Ken Narlow was still waiting for the story to end. He told a reporter, as time goes by, I have my doubts that the Zodiac is still alive. But I still think the case can be solved. That will happen only when some citizen remembers something and comes forth. Narlow remained determined to identify the elusive killer. I really wanted to solve that case before I retired. I will never give up hope. Under the title SFPD Not Thrilled About Spotlight on Zodiac, 
San Francisco Examiner columnist Ken Garcia wrote, It's been nearly four decades since the last murder. The case has officially been listed as inactive. And yet the public fascination with the Zodiac Killer seems to just grow with time, a true story that has expanded into urban myth. And now the movie. Up until a few years ago, police were getting calls on the Zodiac on almost a daily basis, but it took so much time and attention away from ongoing homicide cases that they put it on the inactive list until the day they get a lead that might go somewhere. But they were hoping it wouldn't go to Hollywood, backed by a marketing campaign. It's a legend in the movie making. While preparing for an article about the release of the new film, employees at the San Francisco Chronicle discovered what appeared to be a long-forgotten communication from the elusive pen pal. Postmarked in Eureka, California in December 1990, the red envelope was overlooked amid the many hoax letters and forgeries that plagued the newspaper after the release of Graysmith's first book and the sensational media coverage surrounding the crimes of a Zodiac copycat killer in New York. If the card was an authentic Zodiac communication, the killer was still alive as late as 1990, still taunting and still at large more than 16 years after his brief appearance in 1974. If the killer was aware of the New York imposter, the 1990 card may have been an attempt to reclaim his murderous persona. Addressed to the Chronicle in pencil and with an eerily familiar style, the envelope bore a 25-cent stamp depicting a Christmas tree and contained a holiday greeting card. On the front of the card, a snowman wearing a Groucho Mark nose, mustache, and glasses stands in a snowstorm as a small rabbit watches. The text of the card was reminiscent of the Zodiac's Halloween card to reporter Paul Avery more than 20 years earlier. From your secret pal. Can't guess who I am yet. Well look inside and you'll find out. The inside of the card read, that I'm gonna keep you guessing. Happy holidays, anyway. The writer had also included a Xerox of two keys on a chain attached to a small pen-like cylinder. Marked USPS for the United States Postal Service, the keys had identification numbers of undetermined significance leading to speculation that the Xerox might lead to a post office box containing the identity of the Zodiac, or some other clue that could provide the solution to the case. In the years which followed the release of the 2007 film Zodiac, public interest in the unsolved crimes continued to grow, as did the cottage industry of books, websites, television shows, and movies. The version of the story is told in the books by Robert Graysmith, and the movie adaptation found a new generation of followers and believers of the theory that Arthur Lee Allen was the Zodiac Killer. The sensational spectacle also attracted a new generation of crackpots, opportunists, amateur sleuths, and another copycat killer. On June 21, 2008, the assistant manager of a Fairfield and by Marriott in Fayetteville, North Carolina was called to investigate a foul odor inside room 143. The man discovered a large, crossed circle drawn on the bathroom mirror in lipstick and a decomposed corpse in the tub. The victim was later identified as Megan Lynn Toma a 23-year-old Army dental specialist stationed at the nearby Foot Bragg military base. An autopsy revealed that Toma was pregnant at the time of the murder. As news of the killing spread, the killer issued his own press release. The envelope arrived at the offices of the local newspaper, the Fayetteville Observer, on June 24th. 
The typed letter had been signed with a cross circle symbol and read, To whom it may concern. The following is to inform that I am responsible for the dead body that was found on Saturday, June 21st at 11.30 in room 143 at Fairfield and by Marriott of Skibo R.D. It was a masterpiece. I confess that I have killed many times before in several states, but now I will start using my model signature. There will be many more to come. Fayetteville law enforcement is very incompetent. I basically sat there and watched while investigators were on site. Police later arrested and charged the man who was reportedly engaged to marry Megan, Sergeant Edgar Patino Lopez. A member of the 18th Engineer Brigade, Patino studied psychological operations tactics, including propaganda methods using print, radio, and television news media, as well as other unconventional techniques. Police stated that a typewriter found in the suspect's home matched the Zodiac-like letter sent to the Fayetteville Observer. In 2010, Lopez agreed to plead guilty to second-degree murder in exchange for a lesser sentence of 16 to 20 years. In the summer of 2008, Dr. Lawrence P. D'Antonio surfaced with claims that he had solved the Zodiac case by creating an amazing new technique for discovering hidden messages and images on the Zodiac letters. According to D'Antonio, these messages and images were planted by the infamous Zodiac suspect, Arthur Lee Allen. D'Antonio said that he first came up with this discovery after watching the movie Zodiac and staying awake for three days in a row. D'Antonio then posted his sensational claims on various internet message boards. He claimed to be working with the San Francisco PD and the FBI and claimed that his evidence proved Allen's guilt despite the overwhelming evidence of his innocence. D'Antonio repeatedly announced that he had discovered even more damning evidence against Allen, and he repeatedly claimed that authorities were close to closing the case. However, as time passed, authorities dismissed D'Antonio's claims and evidence. D'Antonio later ended his public campaign and his days as an amateur crime fighter. D'Antonio's press releases stated that he was represented by Larry Garrison, the public relations man behind the next Zodiac publicity stunt. Garrison also represented a San Francisco real estate agent named Deborah Perez, who became the subject of worldwide attention when she called a press conference in April 2009 to declare that the Zodiac was her deceased stepfather Guy Ward Hendrickson. Accompanied by Kevin McLean, a former associate of famed attorney Melvin Belly, Perez told reporters that she first suspected her father was the Zodiac when she saw a sketch of the killer while watching a 2007 episode of the popular crime series America's Most Wanted. I recognized the individual as my father. I researched the Zodiac killer and to my surprise, I found cards and letters that were in police custody that were written by my father or myself. Perez claimed that she had written the now infamous Zodiac letter sent to Melvin Belly in December 1969. Perez explained, I was a child and just thought I was helping my father. Deborah Perez was met with skepticism and ridicule by a collection of Zodiac buffs who had gathered at the press conference. San Francisco Chronicle writer Kevin Fagan attended the conference and wrote that some in the crowd were shouting, Guilty! Guilty! And bullshit! Self-professed Zodiac victim Sandy Betts known for her own claims that the Zodiac had been stalking her for decades, also attended the conference and reportedly told Fagan, they're going to get the guy, 
But it's not who she says, I have the real Zodiac's picture in my car, and he is alive. He fired shots at me. Perez produced a pair of glasses which she believed were taken from the Zodiac's last known victim, cab driver Paul Stein. Police met with Deborah Perez and apparently determined that her claims did not warrant further investigation. Di Ward Hendrickson joined the long list of men who had been wrongfully accused and named as the Zodiac Killer. In 2008, a Google search for the name Guy Ward Hendrickson would have produced nothing to stain his reputation. The same Google search later produced approximately 831,000 results in 0.23 seconds. Virtually all these listings identified Hendrickson as a Zodiac suspect, casting a permanent and dark cloud over his memory. Members of the Hendrickson family refuted the claims made by Deborah Perez, and others questioned her motives and credibility. According to several sources, including true crime writer M. William Phelps, Perez had also claimed that she was the daughter of President John F. Kennedy. Perez eventually vanished from the glare of the spotlight, but her brief appearance had further clouded the public perception of the unsolved mystery. Dennis Kaufman claimed that his stepfather, Jack Terrence, was the Zodiac. Kaufman also claimed that he had searched his father's possessions and discovered several incriminating items, including a roll of film which he believed depicted possible murder victims and a bizarre, hooded costume similar to that used by the Zodiac. After years of promoting himself on the Internet, Kaufman was featured in the cable television program True Crime, hosted by crime writer Aphrodite Jones. Authorities investigated Kaufman's claims and examined his evidence, but found nothing to implicate Jack Terrence in the Zodiac crimes. Kaufman's public campaign continued as other men came forward to accuse their own fathers. Retired LAPD detective turned crime writer Steve Hodel published a book titled Black Dahlia Avenger, in which he claimed that his father, Dr. George Hodel, was responsible for the infamous Black Dahlia murder in the late 1940s. After the success of his first book, Hodel returned with a sequel titled Most Evil. He now claimed that his father was also responsible for the Chicago lipstick murders as well as the Zodiac crimes. Many who had studied the Dahlia and Zodiac cases dismissed Hodel's theories and claims. Steve Hodel had once enjoyed the endorsement of famed writer James Elroy, author of the book Black Dahlia, but Elroy retracted that endorsement after Hodel's theories expanded. Steve Hodel began work on a third book and continued to post new theories and claims on his website. In 2008, another suspect was named by Tom Voigt and an informant known by several aliases. Voigt had a long history of promoting individuals who were known as unreliable sources and informants, including Robert Graysmith, Zodiac slash Manson conspiracy theorist Howard Davis, self-professed Zodiac victim Sandy Betts, and others. Since the late 1980s, Blaine T. Blaine aka Socaterius aka Goldcatcher had claimed that his former friend and associate Richard Gajkowski was the Zodiac. According to Blaine's account, Gajkowski confessed that he was the Zodiac killer and invited Blaine to join him in ongoing acts of shocking violence in what he called the Golden Calf Killings named for the golden calf and the subject of a book which Blaine had written some years earlier. Blaine claimed that he had watched as Gajkowski killed a San Francisco cab driver. Blaine contacted various law enforcement agencies and claimed that he had solved the Zodiac codes and identified Gajkowski as the killer. 
Every single law enforcement agency dismissed Blaine's claims, and a late San Francisco police inspector Mike Maloney reportedly referred to Blaine as one of the top three Zodiac kooks. As the years passed, Blaine occasionally reappeared to tell his story, but few were willing to listen. After Richard Gajkowski died in 2004, Tom Voigt posted public messages on the Internet in an attempt to solicit information about Blaine and Gajkowski. Eventually, Voigt met with Blaine and then launched a public campaign naming Gajkowski as a viable Zodiac suspect. Many people who had known Richard Gajkowski were angered by the accusations and defended his reputation. Despite the lack of credible evidence to implicate Gajkowski in the Zodiac crimes, this theory was later featured in the 2009 television documentary, Mystery Quest. Theorist Gareth Penn self-published his 1987 book titled Time 17, which named former Harvard lecturer Michael O'Hare as the Zodiac Killer. Penn claimed that O'Hare committed the Zodiac crimes as part of an elaborate, intellectual art project, which used the locations of the attacks to create giant, invisible geometric formations. Penn also believed that O'Hare planned more attacks in the future and intended to end the Zodiac story with his own suicide. According to FBI reports, Penn had sent several bizarre messages to O'Hare in an apparent attempt to provoke a response. Penn's odd behavior over the years led some observers to suspect that he might be the Zodiac killer and this theory later dominated many discussions on Internet message boards. Penn's response to these accusations only fueled the suspicions of his accusers. Another Zodiac theorist named Raymond Grant spent two decades creating what eventually became his theory that Penn and O'Hare had worked together to commit the Zodiac crimes with the assistance of their parents. Grant self-published the first editions of his book, The Zodiac Murders Solved, in the early 1990s. Two decades later, in 2010, Grant began posting the ever-changing editions at the two websites devoted to the online promotion of his ever-expanding theories and claims. Several retired police officers resurfaced with an already dismissed suspect who had previously been named in Robert Graysmith's book Zodiac under the pseudonym Andrew Todd Walker. Authorities had originally investigated this suspect in the late 1970s and determined that no evidence linked him to the Zodiac crimes. Years later, the theory was featured in the 2011 book, The Silenced Badge, a.k.a. The Zodiac Killer Cover-Up. According to author Lyndon Lafferty, the Zodiac had escaped justice thanks to interference by a prominent judge who had intervened on the suspect's behalf. Another book named Another Suspect as part of yet another conspiracy plot. Author David M. Sylvie claimed that he had known the Zodiac as well as Zodiac victim Darlene Farron. According to Sylvie, the Zodiac crimes and Farron's death were part of a secret government plot named Project Artichoke. Sylvie died before the book was published. In 2011, student and amateur codebreaker Corey Starleiper claimed that he had solved the Zodiac's infamous 340 cipher. According to Starleiper's solution, the code identified Arthur Lee Allen as the Zodiac killer. Starleiper stated that he had produced his solution shortly after viewing the movie Zodiac, which named Allen as the likely killer. The Starliper solution was rejected by many critics and other amateur codebreakers who had studied the Zodiac codes. Zodiac theorist Mike Rodelli believed that he had identified the Zodiac as a wealthy Bay Area businessman who had lived near the scene of the Zodiac's last known murder in San Francisco. 
Fearful of a potential lawsuit, Rodelli used the pseudonym Mr. X when discussing his suspect in public interviews and internet postings. In 2003, Rodelli appeared on the ABC television show Primetime Live. The broadcast included the revelation that authorities had developed a partial DNA profile obtained from the envelopes and stamps used by the Zodiac Killer. This DNA profile did not match the DNA of Mr. X, who had agreed to the DNA testing and comparison in an effort to end Rodelli's accusations. Like most Zodiac theorists, Rodelli remained convinced that he was right, and the authorities were wrong. Rodelli took his theory to the Internet and later launched a website. Rodelli's theory was featured in the book by author Mike Capuzzo titled, The Murder Room, The Heirs of Sherlock Holmes Gather to Solve the World's Most Perplexing Cold Cases. In 2011, Mike Rodelli publicly posted the real name of his suspect on his website. Attorneys representing Mr. X contacted Rodelli, and Rodelli's website then disappeared from the Internet. Other amateur sleuths used the media and the Internet to offer more theories, cipher solutions, and suspects. The identity of the Zodiac Killer became the holy grail of true crime history. Countless men and women came forward with sensational stories only to be consumed by the endless spectacle and subsequently replaced by the next attention seeker or obsessed armchair detective. Media reports repeatedly resurrected the mystery, and the families of the victims relived the tragedy which had forever changed their lives. Many law enforcement agencies were often forced to waste resources, manpower, and money to investigate each new suspect. Decades of investigation and advances in forensic science produced evidence which authorities believed could be used to identify the Zodiac. A partial DNA profile was obtained from a Zodiac envelope. This partial DNA profile did not match Arthur Lee Allen, Mr. X, or any other suspects. A palm print was lifted from the so-called exorcist letter attributed to the Zodiac in 1974. This palm print did not belong to Allen or any other suspects. Three of the Zodiac's four coded messages remain unsolved and, if deciphered, may reveal information which could identify the Zodiac. Most handwriting experts believed that the Zodiac's handwriting could be used to identify the killer. Experts working with law enforcement concluded that Allen and other suspects did not write the Zodiac letters. The San Francisco Police Department, the Vallejo Police Department, the Napa County Sheriff's Office, and other law enforcement agencies continued to investigate various leads and other attempts to gather new forensic evidence. The debate regarding the possible fate of the Zodiac generated several scenarios. A frequently cited explanation for the Zodiac's disappearance from the public spotlight suggested that the killer was either in prison for some other offense or that he had died without leaving behind some clue to his secret identity. This explanation had also been offered to explain the disappearance of other elusive serial killers such as the Green River Killer and the BTK Strangler. So-called profilers and experts about serial murder often speculated that the Zodiac and other murderers were loners incapable of maintaining steady employment or long-term relationships with women. Decades after they had seemingly vanished from the public spotlight, both the Green River Killer and the BTK Strangler were identified and imprisoned. Both men had maintained steady employment and long-term relationships with women. Ridgeway and Raider were not in prison while absent from the public spotlight.
Both men continued to kill even after authorities and the public believed that their criminal careers had quietly ended. Gary Ridgway, a.k.a. the Green River Killer, may have been responsible for more than 100 murders over the course of two decades. Dennis Rader, a.k.a. the BTK Strangler, was known as a loving husband and father who served as the president of his church. Raider and Ridgway defied the expectations of experts who believed them to be crazed loners and disappointed crime buffs and amateur sleuths looking for diabolical geniuses like the fictional villain Hannibal Lecter. Like the Zodiac, Raider had sent many taunting communications to the media and others, including coded messages which remained unsolved. Upon his arrest, Raider was asked to provide the solution to one of his codes, but he could not remember the hidden message. Gary Ridgway led police to the remains of many victims, but he failed to provide any sufficient answers for those who questioned the motives behind his seemingly senseless crimes. Dennis Raider later admitted that he had planned to leave behind evidence which would identify him as the BTK Strangler after his death. If the Zodiac was at all like his criminal contemporaries, the truth behind his haunting crimes may defy expectations and explanation. The Zodiac remains the most elusive and terrifying ghost in the history of American serial murder. While some believe that the killer died long ago or is locked away somewhere in a prison cell, others believe that he is still out there, watching the world keep his story alive, enjoying his infamy, and waiting to write an ending as shocking as his unforgettable crimes. Journalist Thomas Colbert and his group of sleuth casebreakers have claimed to find evidence suggesting that Zodiac Killer was Air Force veteran Gary Francis Post, who died in 2018. Stay tuned again next week for another episode of The True Crime Tales. Be safe and see you again next time.